We may have more join us as we get going, but good morning and welcome to the Riverside County Suicide Prevention Coalition. This is our third quarterly meeting and we are excited to have you today. Uh, my name is Diana Gutierrez and I am the Prevention and Early Intervention Manager here with Riverside University Health Systems Behavioral Health Department and also one of your coalition leadership co-chairs. Um, I'll let my co-chair introduce herself. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca Antion and I'm a program coordinator with our Injury Prevention Services Branch within RUHS Public Health. And I am also a leadership co-chair. So thank you. Great. I, how about we'll, um, I'm gonna give a few more minutes for more people to join us. We'll review the agenda really quickly. And then we wanna hear, find out a little bit about who's in the room with us today in our Zoom room. Um, but Rebecca, if you, um, oh, I forgot to click that. There we are, me and Rebecca. <laughs> but Rebecca, if you want to review the agenda real quick and then we'll do. Sure. Okay, so uh, we are going to do introductions in a moment. Um, but for today's uh, meeting, we do have a presentation on means safety, which will be given by uh, Stan Collins. And uh, after the presentation, we will be reviewing uh, reports, status reports on uh, the work that our subcommittees have, uh, have been embarking on. Uh, we will follow up with some uh, time for question and answer, uh, general comments, and then we will be closing for today. Terrific, thanks Rebecca. So to find out a little bit more about who's with us today, we are going to do a few polling questions. So, I'm gonna to go to this one and okay. So first question, can you all see that? What region do you represent? Terrific, I'm gonna give everybody about 30 seconds or so to put in their selection. All right, that's the majority of us. I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and share the results. So we can see um, who's in the room with us representing the three areas of our county. We have a pretty nice distribution actually of people that are serving the different regions and then countywide as well. So that's awesome, welcome. Uh, a couple more questions. That's not the one I wanted to share with you, hold on. Hold on guys, user error here, give me one moment. Oh, oh no, oh no. Did you guys lose my screen? Can What can you see? We're seeing the agenda. The agenda. agenda. Sorry. You are, okay, that's good. Cause that's not what I was seeing. Hold on, let's try this again. Going to relaunch. Okay, that should be the right one. Who do you serve? Kid, children, Tay, adults or older adults? What if it's more than one? Um, it should let you pick more than one if you serve more than one area. Yes. All right, that's most of us. Let me end the polling and I'm gonna share the results. And there you see, wow, we have, again, really nice representation across the age groups, which is fantastic. Third question. What best describes your work setting? Do you represent um, RUHS Behavioral Health? Are you a PEI contract provider? Are you from another county department or representing schools, K, um, grades K through 12? 
Anyone here from higher education, colleges or universities, community-based organization, a faith-based organization, a hospital or first responder, any law enforcement or any elected officials? Awesome. I'm gonna give a couple more seconds to get, looks like almost everyone's had a chance to respond. Couple more people still plugging in their answers. I'm gonna give them a few more minutes. You wanna get a really good sense of who's with us today. Okay, I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. All right, so you can get a sense of who is in the room with us today. Um, and so the reason why I wanted to do this and give everybody a chance to see who's in the room is we're building this suicide prevention coalition. Um, we need to look at who's, who's here contributing and um, being a part of our subcommittees and all of our activities and where are the gaps and who do we need more of? And is there even anyone on, not on this list that, that isn't listed that should be? And so um, I will ask for all of you that are here today to be considering who, who's here, who's not here and who ought to be here. And then um, ask that if you know of someone that should be here that isn't, that you um, let me know about them or you tell them about what's going on and we can get them hooked in with the information and get them on our invitation lists so we can build our coalition and really have um, the most robust feedback and information across our entire county. That's the goal. So we've got one more question. And the question is how many times have you attended the Suicide Prevention Coalition? As I said, we're new, this is our third one. So are you a first timer joining us? Have you been to a couple of our meetings or have you been to all three? In between our quarterly meetings, we also have subcommittee meetings. You're gonna get to hear from each of our subcommittee co-chairs uh, later on this morning. Um, and they, each of those subcommittees meet at least once a month. Um, so in between these larger coalitions. So um, this is just, again, an opportunity if it's your first time with us and you, you are interested in being a part of a subcommittee so that you can actively participate in the strategies and objectives, um, we're gonna tell you how you can get connected to us. And so let me share those results. So we've got a lot of first timers, welcome. We're so glad to have you here with us today. And then um, about a third, a little more than a third of us have been to all three. So that's terrific. We love to have everybody continue to be uh, a part of this effort with us and um, look forward to the continued work that we're doing. We have a lot to share with you today, but before we get into the all, all the subcommittee work, we wanna introduce, I would like to introduce our presenter. Because as mentioned earlier, we wanna ensure that our quarterly meetings include learning opportunities to broaden knowledge and build expertise in suicide prevention best practices. We are very lucky to be joined today by Stan Collins. Stan Collins is a suicide prevention specialist with Each Mind Matters, who's worked in the suicide prevention field for two decades since losing a friend to suicide in high school, utilizing his experience to support and develop strategies to create system level change around suicide prevention. Stan serves as a subject matter expert for communications on suicide prevention for the Cal Mesa funded Each Mind Matters campaign. And Stan is also a member of the American Association of Suicidology's communication team. Today's presentation will focus on utilizing mean safety, lethal means restriction and reduction as part of suicide prevention planning with an emphasis on approaches to firearm suicide prevention. The presentation will incorporate background research on the topic, as well as strategies and practical applications for reducing access to lethal means for people at risk of suicide. So please welcome Stan Collins. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much. I uh, appreciate the warm welcome. Thank you, Diana, and everyone for the invitation to be here today. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my slides real quick. And then, uh, Diana, could you just give me a thumbs up if the um, slides are showing and you can hear me. All right, perfect. Uh, so again, my name is Stan Collins. You heard a, a little bit about the work that I do. And today we're gonna be diving deeply into um, addressing reducing access to lethal means or restricting access to lethal means are the two ways we've referred to it in the past. Uh, collectively, we kind of refer to it as means safety. Um, so with that, we're gonna jump in. As I'm going, please feel free to utilize the chat. I'll be stopping frequently for questions and um, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump on in. So actually, let me get the um, chat open just so I can see. 
All right, so sounds good. We're gonna jump in. So uh, when we're thinking about how does mean safety fit into overall suicide prevention, uh, the comprehensive approach to suicide prevention created by the Suicide Prevention Resource Center lists reducing access to lethal means as one of the key elements. And there's strategies, and we're gonna break this down a little bit more as we go, uh, from individual all the way, you know, from relationships into the community level. I did also want to highlight that means safety is identified uh, just in case uh, you're not familiar uh, as part of your uh, local strategy as well. So with that, and I apologize, uh, one second, I'm normally pretty tech savvy, but somehow I, there you go, I lost all video, so I wasn't sure if there were still real people existing in the world. So now I can see you again, I apologize. Um, so a few things just to consider or ask yourself as you're jumping into mean safety and um, granted, this is focused on strategic planning, but how do you, you know, how do you take the, those efforts and implement them? So one, it starts with data collection, looking at your data. And as I'm going to share with you in a moment, uh, I'm really impressed, probably so more so with your county than any other county in terms of the quality of data that you've collected around mean safety. Um, but through that data, we can find out what are the most common methods used? Are there any site-specific locations we need to be addressing or concerned about? Um, but it also starts with looking at, are we currently doing anything for mean safety? And I'm going to talk with you on different areas of mean safety, uh, focused on different means, as well as some other strategies. Uh, so with that, let's get into some of, before we get into any specifics around firearm safety or, um, you know, prevention of overdose, uh, let's focus on some of the principles and background. And uh, sorry, I just want to check the chat. Again, feel free to chat in at any time. All right, so what we do know is that mean safety is one of the most effective strategies. I was just at the American Association of Suicidology Conference last week. And again, as researchers and clinicians were speaking, one of the things they identified was, or continue to identify is that mean safety is one of the most research evidence-based uh, evidence ways to change, you know, change the conversation, to have an impact. Now, the quote that you see there, most efforts to prevent suicide focus on why people take their lives. We spend a lot of time in the area of why, but we don't spend enough time in the how. And as we're gonna learn today or walk away with today, I hope that you're, you're gonna see that how someone attempts suicide is really important to the outcomes. So that quote was taken from meansmatter.org, which is an effort from the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, this came out a decade or so ago, and it really was a beautiful, it's a beautiful tool. And basically it compiles a lot of the research and the evidence base. So if you want to go deeper with this and kind of geek out as I do on this topic, I really encourage you to spend some time. It's going to re uh, refer you to some of those top research studies that really lay out the foundational uh, framework for why means matter. So when it comes to reducing access to lethal means, so as I referred to mean safety, uh, there's a few things to consider. One is that we assume that if someone uses a more lethal form of suicide or for their attempt, that there is a greater level of intensity or intent behind that attempt. And the research dispels that. That's not actually the case. Regardless of the mechanism that someone uses, uh, the intent to die is fairly consistent. Now that matters because with firearm suicide attempts, they are lethal in 85 to 95 percent of the time. Now on the flip side of the spectrum from this is, uh, for example, medications, where 0.5 to 2% of suicide attempts by overdose are fatal, and as you see, one to three. So the lethality is greatly determined by the means or mechanism that's used in that attempt. But again, cho choice of those means and mechanisms is not related to how, you know, the intent that person has. Now, why does this matter? This matters because we know that 90% of people who attempt suicide will not go on to die by suicide later in life. Even more profound than that is that we know 70% of people who attempt suicide will not go on to attempt again. So all this to say, if we can have someone survive, especially that first attempt, if that attempt can be made less lethal, um, that person is likely to go on and live a full life not dying by suicide. Now, I'm going to get into this more in just a moment, but a lot of people will say, well, won't they just find another way? And numerous of studies have, have demonstrated that there is a lack of substitution. 
And there's a, a gentleman who's, who's really profound in this field. His name is Mike Anestis, and he's been looking at firearm suicide prevention for a long time. And one of the com concepts that he introduced me to, and, and this has you know, been relevant with other attempt survivors or people with lived experience, is that when someone begins to formulate a plan for suicide, they oftentimes have an image of what a suicide attempt would look like in their life or to them. And they oftentimes we get tied to that image and what that image sounds like. So for us to have substitution, it goes against that image that we've created. Now, um, as I mentioned, there's numerous research studies that have supported mean safety. Uh, here's just a few examples on the screen. So I'm not going to go over each and every one of them. The short version is that when efforts have focused on one of the highest contributors or highest means or methods to suicide deaths, what they often find when they reduce access or restrict access to that mechanism, of course, we would assume that suicides using that mechanism would go down. But what these studies have found is that suicides overall went down. So it really pushed back against this idea of substitution. Now, um, with that, again, this there's this myth, there's this perpetuating myth out there, which is that, well, people just find another way. If you if you take away the, the firearm, they're gonna get the pills. If you take away the pills, they're gonna to go to the bridge. If you go to take, put a barrier on the bridge, and we, again, keep kicking the can down the road. But again, numerous studies have shown that there is a lack of substitution. And as I talked about, people are oftentimes tied to that image. Um, as we're going along here now, I realized that I should have started with this, and so I wanna pause and just acknowledge, um, although we, you were told what the content of this presentation would be, um, I myself am a lost survivor. That's why I do this work. I imagine there's many other lost survivors on the meeting today. Uh, so getting into conversations about means and methods um, can be activating for many people. So if, if you're, you're starting to like, as we're getting into the content, realize, oh, maybe this isn't for me. Uh, maybe it's just not the right day for you. Um, I will not take any disrespect if you need to step out for this part of the meeting. Um, Diane, I don't know if we have an idea of when the the second half of the committee reports. Hopefully you'll stick around, but if you do, uh, maybe coming around back around 10 o'clock would be good. Um, I just wanted to give that activation warning and I apologize I didn't do that sooner. All right, so how do we restrict access to lethal means? How do we reduce access? For one, we put the person in a safe environment. Um, now that environment can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Oftentimes people will assume that putting someone in a hospital setting will be that safe environment where they won't have access to lethal means. And, and one thing we've seen is that unfortunately there is no such thing as a perfectly safe environment. There we can put them in a safer environment though. We can put a barrier, an actual barrier that restricts access. So that's why you see the word reduce versus restrict kind of used interchangeably or have been used interchangeably. Um, but really what we wanna do is restrict, not just reduce that access. Also putting time. A lot of people don't realize, and a lot of the evidence around suicide attempts show that the crisis is, is typically fairly short-lived. Now, what I mean by that is someone may have thoughts of suicide for months or even years, but within that time frame, there's likely only a handful of moments where that person is in so much emotional pain that they're actually capable of going through a suicide attempt. And the estimates are anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes of where that crisis peaks. So one thing to remember, one thing we really need to message about to community members, family members, mental health professionals, is, is that time is on our side. If that person is with us, uh, we can keep that person safe, restrict access to lethal means in that environment. Um, that, that window is, is likely gonna slow down in, or in a short period of time. And then again, knowing that substitution is unlikely to occur, but that if it does, we wanna be uh, moving people towards less lethal means, less lethal attempts. So looking at wisdom from other injury prevention, when we look at, say, car safety, the primary prevention is brakes, right? Getting the cars to just stop. Uh, that secondary level is we have airbags and crumple zones. So if an, if an event does occur, um, how can we reduce the injury from that event? So this goes back to that idea of substitution. And then that final area is how do we respond effectively? How do we get people the proper care and uh, when it comes to suicide prevention, it's not just proper care for the individual event, right? It's that ongoing uh, proper you know, support and ongoing care. 
Now, as we look at mean safety efforts, some of the key components that have been prevalent in most of the efforts that we've seen is number one, just engaging the public about this, letting them know that this is part of the conversations that we need to be having about suicide prevention, and reducing risk for individuals who are having thoughts of suicide. Another element is getting information and training to those key gatekeepers. And we're gonna work through, uh, again, different efforts or different means and methods and how to restrict those, but from firearm instructors to family members and pharmacists, uh, getting people to, to recognize the warning signs, the risk factors, and connecting that person prior to an attempt. But one of the things that I think is not quite robust enough is lethal means counseling. So that is counseling for healthcare providers, mental health professionals, um, on when working with a patient, working with an individual, um, having conversations. And this, I think a lot of the lack of this com these conversations come from a lack of comfort with the topic. So I'm gonna give you some resources on how folks can get trained up on those and how it really is such a vital part of suicide prevention means safety. Now, all of this is part, all of this ideas around mean safety is really a core element of the California strategic plan striving for zero to prevent suicide. And so I just wanted to highlight that this is not just something your county is doing or that there's been some research about. Uh, this is really the, one of the key endorsed activities from across the state. All right, so with that, I'm gonna pause for one second and see if any questions have come in. I haven't seen anything quite yet. Diana or Mindy, am I missing any questions coming in? It looks like we have a hand raised, Rebecca Varghese. Did you have a question? No, I'm sorry, I didn't. Okay. All right, well, again, please, as I'm going, feel free to type in any questions as we move along here. Oh, so Omar's asking if you can go back to the statewide slide. And Omar, did you have a question about it? Uh, no, I just wanted to uh, take a look at it. Um, seems like it's it's good for me to know. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe uh, we'll be sharing the, the PDF of the slides. Is that correct, Diana? Yes, we will. You'll get a copy of these at the end of our time today. Yeah, and, and part of that, just so you know, when you get the slides, you're going to get um, some of the slides I, I'm going to skip over and move kind of quickly through today, just out of respect for time. Um, so you're going to have more slides than we really go into depth with, so you can have um, even a, a broader picture of that. So again, um, just uh, Omar, since you were looking at it, this is maybe a little better shot of it. So um, everything from site-specific efforts in the, in the statewide strategy to firearm suicide prevention, safe medication distribution, uh, disseminating, disseminating information on overdose prevention. Uh, we've seen the distribution of Narcan really uh, be rolled out throughout our country and that data collection piece, right? Using data to drive the efforts, but also not just data on um, incidents, also on preventative acts, which we'll talk about as well. Thank you. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about data and how data can drive our efforts a little bit. So um, this is taken from one of the toolkits that I'll mention later. So this is countermeasures to, um, focused on railway incidents, but how it's really important to look at every incident, uh, every event that occurs so that we can learn more about how to prevent them. We need to look at them um, kind of holistically at each event and understand what are the, the different opportunities. Now, again, that primary prevention is our goal is not to have people have thoughts of suicide in the first place, but when those progress into plans and actions, uh, we wanna take steps to be able to reduce that. So again, refocusing on some of those statewide strategies, um, identifying reviewing data to identify those means and methods, exploring how they vary by demographics. Um, oftentimes the data is simply here's our percentage of means and methods by, by each you know, component. Um, but one of the things that I'm gonna share with you here in just a second is that I really love that uh, your demographic data related to means and methods. Uh, so here's just overall in California, what does the data look like? And we're gonna go into your local data. Um, you see that again, uh, firearm continues to be one of the predominant forms of suicide. And I'm gonna spend a, a big chunk or portion of the time today talking about firearm suicide prevention. That's a real passion of mine. We see poisoning, um, although as you'll see the local data used in a lot of attempts, uh, doesn't result in, in many deaths, um, but just kind of this is what it looks like from the statewide picture. So let's look at some of your local data. So you see here it identifies which of the lines, uh, hopefully you're familiar with this, this is taken from your strategic plan 
and your local data. Uh, but cutting and piercing firearms um, are up here at the top, followed by hanging and suffocation. So similar uh, kind of trajectory is what you see on the statewide level when it comes to means of death. And you see that, that it fluctuates over time. Uh, one of the things that is concerning is that hanging and suffocation has been on the rise in most in multiple age groups, especially younger age groups. Um, and by younger, I mean young adult age groups specifically. Um, and so that continues to increase. And one of the, the main concerns there is that hanging and suffocation, uh, as far as means safety, is one of the hardest to restrict that access to those lethal means. All right, so again, I've, I've been raving about your data collection. You're one of the few counties that I've seen collect demographic data uh, and split it up when addressing means and methods. Uh, so this breaks it down means of deaths for, for males. Um, so you'll see firearms and hanging and suffocation. One of the things that's important to note about as we're looking at the data on males and females, and apologies for the, the binary nature of the data, but as you know, that's how it's presented and we're working to change that, is that females actually attempt suicide about four times as often as males, but males die by suicide about three times as often as females, which almost kind of doesn't make sense, right? You would assume if I have a larger number of attempts in this group, I should have a larger number of suicide deaths. But in reality, although there's a larger number of attempts with females, there's a, a larger percentage of the males who make an attempt will die from that attempt. And it all comes back to the means and methods that they utilize in that attempt. Males typically will choose a much uh, a more lethal means for those attempts, as you saw firearm and hanging suffocation. Um, whereas females, as the data shows here, um, are more likely to utilize poisoning or overdose for that suicide attempt. So again, by looking at different demographic groups and how the means apply to that, the means and methods used in that group, um, we can start to have more focused efforts for prevention among these groups. And it's, as I'm uh, also continue to be impressed because your data doesn't just break down means um, and methods for deaths, but also for attempts. And so this is really important. And again, you see that the majority of attempts, uh, earlier I mentioned that about half a percent to 2% of attempts utilizing overdose or poisoning are lethal. And so we're gonna see a, a much higher incidence of these in the, uh, through attempt survivors uh, in the hospital setting. Um, as mentioned always, uh, or as well, uh, firearms are a very small percentage of people who survive an attempt because of the lethality of that attempt. And that's why uh, so much of our efforts around means safety has focused on that firearm prevention. And there are a couple of questions. Do you want to take them now or wait? Uh, sure. Yeah, let me look at them real quick. Wanda's asking. Oh, I, I want me to read them to you. Sure. What do you attribute the increase in hangings and suffocations to? You know, that's that's something that really has been debated, and I don't know that I have an answer for it. Um, I would put it out to the group if you have any ideas. Um, one is that it's it's unfortunately, and as you see on the screen, it's one of the most accessible uh, means and methods out there. There's a variety of, of, of items that people can use as ligatures. Um, I think also, or one theory potentially, I spent a lot of my time talking about messaging. And I think that uh, the incidence of celebrity suicides or high profile suicides may have been uh, feeding that as well. Um, so I don't have a clear cut answer and I apologize, I can't answer, answer that 100%, um, but we're looking into it. And, and you one said- more, One yeah. more question. Does intentional overdose fall in the poison category? Uh, yes, most of the time. However, when it comes to hanging and suffocation, firearm attempts are, are typically more clearly a suicide attempt. Um, if someone is known to have intentionally overdosed, then yes, that would be ruled a suicide. But I would say that estimates around, and they vary, um, but when someone does, uh, you know, uses overdose or poisoning to make a suicide attempt that results in death, uh, without clear cut evidence of, of it being an intent for suicide, they are, they are probably the most likely form of suicide attempt or, or means and methods that are, are to be underreported or, or incorrectly reported as a suicide. So yes, if we know that someone intentionally overdosed, then it is rolled a suicide. 
Um, but the steps to get to that confirmation are a lot more difficult when it comes to poisoning and overdose, uh, especially if it's use of um, what can be classified as like a recreational drug. Um, so it's tough to have the data. That's one thing to know is that data for suicide um, uh, is always going to be un oftentimes underreported. One of the areas that we don't speak to, I had the opportunity when I was younger to present before the United States Senate, and I had an offline conversation with the Surgeon General at the time, David Satcher, and he suspects that, he told me that he suspects that more than 50% of single car accidents are suicide related as well. Um, and we very rarely see car accidents ruled as a suicide. And when you look at suicide behaviors among diverse populations, um, oftentimes, um, these, these incidents are masked as that, so. Um, and I see another question about firearms and ammunition, so I'm gonna hold off on that one and address it as we dive into the firearm piece. All right, so we're gonna deep dive into firearm suicide prevention. Again, that activation or content warning. Um, as we're going into this, I won't be showing any images or portrayals or anything like that. I, do, I did just wanna um, give it that other content warning there. So again, the statewide strategy focuses on uh, mean safety, especially around uh, firearm suicide prevention. I'm, I've been doing a lot of work in this field over the last few years, and uh, we'll be rolling out a, an effort on the statewide level here shortly that I'll be able to re report back to you, hopefully at the next meeting. Um, but again, knowing that firearms are the most lethal form of suicide attempt, uh, and one of the most common, uh, we really, if we want to make an impact on suicides, we really have to spend some time looking at firearm suicide prevention. Now there's a variety of supports that we have. That's one of the, the pieces of good news is we're not starting from scratch. There are materials and efforts and models that we can look at to follow. Now, one of the ideas for this is that if suicides, if firearm suicides are one of the predominant forms in which people die locally and nationally, if we focus, you know, we don't have the bandwidth to necessarily focus on everything, right? We want to do everything, but sometimes we have to prioritize. And I would recommend prioritizing on firearm suicide prevention, because as you see in this quote, even if we had small relative declines in, in firearm suicide deaths, that could potentially have huge impacts on overall suicide and suicide prevention. So again, just really reiterating uh, the power that we can have when we focus on firearm suicide prevention. So it may come as no surprise to many of you, and you probably have heard reports of this in news media, uh, but firearm sales over the past 12 months have, have really broken through a, a new ceiling and level in response to COVID-19, in response to social unrest. Um, the demographics are fairly interesting as well when you really break it down. But what we know is that here in California and across the country, we have more firearms out in the communities than ever before. Uh, we also know that having a firearm in the home can increase risk of suicide uh, just by the nature of having it there. Now, uh, that is not to, uh, as we're getting in this conversation, I wanna be clear that this has nothing to do with gun control. This has to do with firearm safety. I come from a family of law enforcement. I've been around firearms my entire life. Um, as we get into the efforts around firearm suicide prevention, it really has to do with implementing or including firearm suicide prevention as a component of firearm safety. Now, this is a study that came out last year as well. It was really interesting um, because it looked at suicide rates of firearm owners over time. Now, we used to believe that the average time that someone owned a firearm prior to using it in an, in an attempt was about seven to 10 years. Most people thought that you know, anecdotally that it was right after purchase. And then the data, when it looked at it, said, no, that's actually not the case. Most people have these firearms for a period of, of years before they make the attempts. Uh, but what this shows, and if you look down here on the, um, the x-axis, it's looking at number of months. Uh, so we see, see significant drop-offs um, right here, you know, after the one-year mark, and it continues to decline. I think it's a little bit more heightened or highlighted on this next slide. Uh, but what they found over the study that looked at uh, thousands of people, um, not just firearm owners, but what it found was that the majority of suicides by firearm occurred in the first 365 days in the first year. 
Um, the one to 10 day period obviously was pretty low here in California. We have the 10 day waiting period uh, for purchasing a firearm. But then you see significant numbers within the first 30 days, first 90 days, and within that first year. So going back to the previous slide, if we have a, a, the largest amount of firearms or new firearm owners in our, in our state at this moment, many of who have been restricted to um, accessing or attending a firearm safety course, um, oftentimes limited in safe storage of firearms, uh, we really are at the kind of precipice of a potential, um, you know, potentially huge issue when it comes to firearms and suicide prevention, especially knowing uh, the heightened levels of mental health concerns that we have. So it's really important that we start to address and have conversations. Again, focus on the firearm community, but also on counseling on lethal means. Um, so I'd, I'd also be happy to share the report, but the title is here, Handguns and suicide in California, and the link is there. So when you get the PDF of the slides, you'll be able to, to look for the article. Uh, but pretty profound information that they found. All right, as we're jumping into the, the content around firearm suicide prevention, I wanted to share with you that uh, fortunately, a couple years ago, California updated the penal code. So me and Diana are friends. So let's say that Diana comes to me and she says, she knows that I have firearms. She's noticed some behavior changes in me. And she says, hey, Stan, I know you've been having a hard time with everything you've been going through. I noticed you've been pulling back, withdrawing. I also know you have access to a firearm. Are you having thoughts of suicide? Okay, yes, yes, I am. I really think we should get the guns out of the home. Why don't you give me the firearms? And now if she would have done that three years ago, that would have been a felony for her and a felony for me because um, you can't transfer firearms that way in California. We have very strict laws about how, who can have purchased transfer firearms. Fortunately, though, we have what was what's referred to as a safe harbor law. So if Diana did that, and the reason why she did that is because I'm suicidal, she would be covered and I would be covered. Uh, the penal code's been updated to allow that that transfer of firearms can occur as long as the individual taking the firearms is not prohibited from owning a firearm as long as they have the, uh, as long as they are 18 years old, and also as long as they have the ability to store them safe. Uh, so this is really a huge sea change in how we can do firearm suicide prevention, knowing that in my opinion, this is one of the most real applications. I'm gonna talk to you about storage at retailers or gun shops. Um, we're gonna just touch real quickly on the gun balance restraining order. Uh, but that penal code, that safe harbor law, really embraces the individual's rights without, uh, you know, getting into this conversation about Second Amendment rights and allows it to be a partnership between two friends or family members. But it does put accountability on the firearm owners. I also wanted to share this website with you. This is a phenomenal website. So earlier I mentioned the Means Matter website out of Harvard. Uh, this website is from the Education Fund to Stop Gun Violence but it is specifically on firearm suicide prevention. So again, it lists, it links to many of the research and studies uh, that support firearm suicide prevention. Also, it's just a phenomenal you know, website to navigate and support. And one of the things that I like about it is that it works through those different rings and levels uh, at the societal level that we talked about earlier, from individual all the way to you know, community and societal. So it breaks down and it gives opportunities and strategies um, kind of at each phase on how to address firearm suicide prevention. Um, and the conceptual model is, is kind of what we talked about to kick this off, is that if, if we have means restriction and we have means safety when we identify people at risk for suicide, um, that if substitution does, does occur or an attempt does occur, that substitution will provide for those attempts to be less lethal, or ideally that restriction leads to a delay in that attempt not occurring at all and that that crisis will pass over. And as I mentioned, uh, the, on the website, you'll find different steps at, you know, for acute risk versus um, you know, different risk factors and such. So I would encourage you to spend some time on that website. And again, you'll get the link in the PDF. Now, one of the other steps that we can take to prevent firearm suicide is the gun violence restraining order. Now, in my work, with the firearm community, with gun shops and gun ranges, um, they have very strong feelings about Second Amendment rights. And they are very, most of the time, very opposed to gun violence restraining orders. 
Um, one of the things of note, though, is that when you look at the actual breakdown of how the gun violence restraining order has been used, it was initially enacted to prevent uh, mass shootings or violence against others. But when it's actually been utilized, most often the case or the cause is for suicide prevention. Uh, there's a lot of anecdotal stories of people who have been intervened with that have had, you know, actually had positive experiences in the long run. Um, but when working with the firearm community, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, there's such strong feelings about this that I really try to set this to the side, knowing that we have it in our back pocket if needed, but really trying to empower the firearm community to embrace their, their own skills to identify when someone is having thoughts of suicide and moving from least restrictive to most restrictive. So utilizing that safe harbor law or storage at a, a gun shop or gun range. Um, and then if all else fails, jumping into that realm of GBRO. All right, I'm gonna pause for another second and see if any other questions have, oh, lots of questions are coming in, it looks like. Um, maybe I'm gonna wait for just a moment then I'm coming back to the questions so we can go all over. Uh, one of the projects though that has been um, rolled out across the country is the Gunshot Project. So you see on the map, that's from the Means Matters website, a variety of efforts have been rolled out across the country. And the Gunshot Project started after a gun, uh, gun shop owner had sold a firearm to an individual. And a couple of years after that purchase, uh, that individual used the firearm bought at that store for a suicide attempt. And the owner of that gun shop felt a real moral imperative to make it, you know, how I just can't imagine how bad someone would feel if they, if someone sold a thing to an individual that ended up being used in a suicide attempt. So we worked with local suicide prevention advocates to create the Gunshot Project, which basically focused on raising awareness in the firearm community about warning signs and risk factors for suicide, how to have a conversation, and then how to get those firearms out of the home. Now it started in New Hampshire, and in New Hampshire, the motto is live free or die. So you can kind of do whatever you want with your firearms in New Hampshire. In California, as, as I said earlier, uh, our gun laws are much more restrictive. So when we brought the effort, we had some requests to adapt the materials to through each by matters to California, to bring in California data, update some of the language. Um, but San Diego County specifically really wanted to take it one step further. And so uh, Yana and I worked with them to update the brochure and really give uh, suicide prevention specific materials or, or content. Uh, one, we worked with gun shop owners and firearm communities. We did focus groups uh, to get their feedback on the brochure. And a couple of things that they noticed, they really wanted the materials to be very specific to suicide prevention. Uh, the gun shop project initially tried to just gently embed suicide prevention as a component of firearm safety. Um, but these materials were greatly adapted, lots of information on how to recognize warning signs, uh, where to go, and uh, the materials, and I apologize, these numbers aren't updated, uh, but we have we were able to implement this program in over 20 different gun shops across the county, um, and it, it goes to different levels. Uh, some of the gun shops uh, offered to display the brochures, and that was the extent of that. Uh, some gun shops have been welcoming to have gatekeeper training, so to have me come in and provide uh, gatekeeper trainings to their gun shop staff so that they can recognize risk and also be more comfortable with conversations. And then what I'm really excited about is I had the opportunity a few months ago, uh, about a month ago, to meet with some firearm instructors. And so they are going to be incorporating about 10 minutes of, on suicide prevention into their general uh, novice and intermediate firearm safety courses. And what's remarkable about that is just at that one gun range, that's an additional 10,000 people who are in a higher risk category by the nature of being firearm owners who likely would not have been exposed to suicide prevention content or information. Now receiving that content from the tr their, their most trusted source of information on firearm safety, their firearm safety instructor, their firearm instructor. Um, so kind of a layered approach. Another thing that same gun shop is doing is that with every purchase of a firearm, they're including one of those brochures. So instead of just being passively uh, passing those out, um, kind of actively giving those to every firearm purchase. On San Diego County, we also created the website, stopfirearmsuicidesd.org, where people can go to learn more and dive deeper into it. And uh, hopefully soon we're gonna be able to add an interactive map like some other states such as Utah and Colorado have been able to do 
so that you can go to the website, look on the map and find the gun shop that's closest to you. Uh, the American, uh, Foundation, uh, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention also came out with some materials. The firearms and suicide prevention is kind of a general uh, warning signs, risk factors, suicide prevention 101, if you will, and a brochure. And then also really powerful is this one, after a suicide, a guy for gun ranges. Um, unfortunately, gun ranges have been uh, locations with high incidence of suicides. And so this helps them to respond, but also talks about some of the protocols. Um, and working with gun ranges, there are some significant key steps that have been shown to be effective in reducing suicides at gun ranges. Uh, they don't really talk about them publicly because they don't want people to start strategizing on how to you know, go around those, those preventative efforts, uh, but there are some strategies out there to reduce that. Um, examples from other states, uh, again, I mentioned Utah and Colorado have some phenomenal programming. Um, the gun storage map, that's kind of the example of what we can bring hopefully here to California shortly. All right, so with that, I am gonna go ahead and pause for a second and see if any questions. I know there was, looks like there was a lot of questions, so I'm gonna ask if you can help me. Um, yeah, just, real quick. just a few questions actually. Um, oh, okay. Let's see, where does jumping from a ridge fall, that jumping was one of the categories I think in the data collection, right? Correct, yeah, and although jumping, uh, gets one of the most is one of the most public um, forms of suicide death and suicide attempt. It's actually one of the lowest uh, incidents. So it's reported about a lot because it typically occurs in the public space. And but it's actually one of the lowest uh, methods or means used for suicide. Are untrained and accidental firearm deaths considered suicide? Um, not if they're accidental. If they are purely accidental, which does occur. Um, and I'm sorry, the un, I'm not sure the untrained uh, portion of that, what exactly that means. But no, if it's accidental, and again, this comes back to the sophistication of the coroner, the medical examiner making the determination. Unless there is clear evidence to support um, through their investigation that this was an intentional, this was a suicide attempt, uh, they will not rule that as, as, a, as a suicide. It is more likely that a suicide uh, doesn't get ruled as suicide um, than an unintentional is to get ruled um, as a suicide. That made, that made any sort of sense of it. Mm -hmm. And last question, is there a large difference in the number of suicides by firearms in an open carry state? Uh, not necessarily determined by open carry, but uh, states that do have open carry typically have higher percentage of gun ownership. States that have higher percentages of gun ownership typically have suicide rates. So it's not necessarily tied to the open carry portion of it, um, but it is tied to just gen the more guns we have in a community, uh, the higher rates of gun ownership, the higher incidence of suicide by firearms. That's it for now. Okay, great. Um, and I apologize. I somehow skipped over some things. No, actually, here one more popped up. Then while you're while you hesitate, are you aware of a California database that differentiates rural versus suburban or urban firearm deaths? Uh, well, we do have the epicenter of the California Department of, of Public Health uh, data collection system, so you can sort by county. You, um, I don't believe that it has a mechanism to sort sort by rural or urban, but you know, by looking at the county, um, but also some counties vary, right? Some parts of your county are, you know, mostly urban, but you also have some very rural portions as well. Um, so even within a county, we have a mix of rural and, and, and urban. Um, so not specifically, but you can sort by county. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. Uh, so I mentioned another key element on, on, you know, when it comes to mean safety is counseling on lethal means. So when someone is connected to someone in healthcare, behavioral health, mental health professional, we need to be willing and able to have conversations. So what is counseling on lethal means? It's basically when we determine that somebody has thoughts of suicide or is at risk for suicide, we have a conversation with them about what is their plan? What access do they have to lethal means, especially firearms? And then we work with that individual, um, understanding that you know, helping them to understand that we want to keep them safe. And the higher access or greater access that they have to the most lethal forms of suicide, the grit, you know, their life is in greater danger. And so it's about working collaboratively with that, collaboratively with that individual and their friends and family member. 
Um, so when it comes to counseling, what should it include? It's, you know, one is it's important for the individual to be competent, not just in the research, but also in the culture. Uh, one of the things that I do and one of the, the efforts I've seen be effective is for mental health professionals who are one of the more likely individuals who would be having these conversations is to get competency about firearms. Um, if you've never held a firearm, loaded a firearm, unloaded a firearm, it can be difficult to work with someone uh, you know, about reducing their access to those firearms. And so that cultural competency, looking at firearm owners as a culture, um, obviously there's diversity within that culture, um, but um, just understanding it. Also understanding the data, the research, so that when you have myths thrown back at you, being able to support it with data and saying, well, actually, no, 60% uh, of firearm deaths in our country are actually suicides, not homicides. Another thing I tell when I work with gun shop owners is um, if, if not for the moral, moral purpose of this, um, if we could reduce suicide deaths, knowing that suicide firearm deaths, knowing that they represent 60% of the overall firearm deaths in our country, um, that actually will take pressure off of them in conversations about firearm deaths in general. Uh, so a few options for counseling on lethal means, the SPRC, Suicide Prevention Resource Center, recently updated their training counseling on lethal means. It's a completely online training. Uh, it's gotten really good responses, especially the updated version. Uh, so that is one access uh, point that is available again for free. It's a couple hours of training. Uh, UC Davis uh, last year, and they have continued to update this, rolled out the bullet points training, which is specifically counseling on lethal means strategies uh, for clinical providers, um, but primarily focused on that firearm uh, mean and method reduction. Uh, so there's some information on that. The website has really become more and more robust over the last few months as well. Uh, they saw the, the need in California with all the purchases and, and the, you know, the response from the pandemic we talked about earlier. And also as part of counseling on lethal means, I don't think we have enough, enough rollout of safety planning when we're having conversations with people who have, been, have identified as at risk for suicide. So ensuring that the safety planning intervention or a similar effort is part of our conversations when we're talking to somebody. So not only are we restricting access to lethal means, but we're also empowering that individual uh, so that they have steps and skills that they can take to de-escalate themselves prior to it becoming a crisis. All right, so when it comes to mean safety around poison and overdose, uh, we actually have seen some examples of this being effective. Many uh, communities and counties have medication take back days or safe disposal efforts. Uh, so there's a variety of, of efforts, um, you know, just simple education that most people don't realize. You can go to your local police station, sheriff's department, um, almost every single one of them is gonna have a medication disposal process or a tool there at that location. Um, but promoting these to get those old medications out of the home can be effective. Glenn County, I love this effort. What they did is they printed Know the Science materials on their pharmacy bags so that every person who was providing, um, you know, being provided with medications was getting information on the National Lifeline and access. Um, I actually had the opportunity to work with the University of California, San Diego. Uh, this is one of the few articles that I was able to help support publishing. Uh, but we were able to train. We train every pharmacist prior to graduation from the School of Pharmacy at UCSD. And if you think about it, the pharmacist is giving means and methods across that counter. That's why those pharmacy bags can be effective, but even more effective when combined with a pharmacist who's been trained to identify suicide risk. Uh, do a, a simple risk screening and then uh, be competent in how to make that referral. So we know, again, going back to that idea of gatekeeper trainings, uh, we need to have multiple layers uh, for these efforts to be support, uh, to be effective. I, was, I think a couple questions have come in earlier, or the question earlier we had about JUMP, uh, which is related to site-specific locations. Um, technically, what is considered a hot spot for uh, suicide is if there is one, more than one suicide at a location per year, on average, uh, that is considered a hot spot for suicide and needs us to be paying attention and looking at it. So um, there's a few studies that have looked at mean safety along bridges. Um, I had the opportunity to work with some entities that are uh, building barriers on bridges. Um, one of the lacks, you know, gaps in information is what exactly the specifics of those barriers should look like. Uh, there are some height requirements for nets versus um, fencing 
Um, so netting below or fencing above or to the side. Uh, but one of the things that was consistent in all of these studies is that it really needs to be a complete barrier. Uh, if you're not going to make the barrier cover 100% or limit 100% of access, it's really not gonna be as effective. Uh, but looking at the data, um, we saw that for bridges and bar you know, heights locations that implemented you know, completely effective barriers, suicide rates did go down. Now in California, this applies. Uh, many of you are familiar with the efforts on the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, which is, I believe, nearly complete, actually. They're doing well. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation in San Diego around the Coronado Bridge, which is the number two location behind the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, or unfortunately will likely become the number one location for suicide deaths in California. And then over in uh, Pasadena and the Colorado Street Bridge uh, began construction last year. So we are seeing examples of these bridges. And more importantly, I think, and I, I apologize, I forget what county it is, uh, but we're also starting to see people incorporate this idea as they're creating new structures and new barriers. So they're, we're not going having to go back and retrofit those structures. Uh, parking structures are also a, a location of high incidence. Um, you see here the data from this report, 41 had experienced a suicide, so almost half of parking structure uh, locations that were of certain heights. Um, so it's about installing those barriers. It's about safe messaging. How do we promote access to those supports? And also railway means safety. I don't believe, I'm not sure. I, well, no, you do have some railways going through uh, Riverside County. So. Um, also efforts in some reports. Um, I'm kind of moving through this quickly. Again, I wanted to give you way more information for the slides that you can go back and reference, uh, but I also want to be respectful of the time. Uh, Diana, how much longer would you uh, like me to spend on this? Uh, you can do another 10 or 15 minutes or so. Okay, perfect. Um, I will say that railways have been one of the locations where we see probably some of the most uh, prominent public messaging around suicide prevention. Um, from the BART train or the SMART train up in the North Bay area. Um, one of the, the interesting points though is uh, working with new railways that are being installed. How do we, if we're going to put out messaging, how do we put out messaging that doesn't inadvertently cause a connection from suicide to the railway systems? Um, obviously it varies by community as far as the number of incidents of suicides. So I mentioned earlier, we talked about data, the importance of gathering data. Another key component of data that we want to gather is data on preventative acts. Uh, the Golden Gate Bridge is one example of a location where they actually do get pretty good data on the preventative acts. Uh, the Coast Guard, as well as the California Highway Patrol, uh, through their efforts, will track preventative acts. Um, but I think when it comes to data, around suicide prevention, we need to do a much better job on when suicides are prevented, for tracking those, reporting on those, uh, to really paint a, a broader picture for the average individual of what it is that we're trying to accomplish and how impactful that can be. Um, so we really need to be looking at efforts to, to build that data. So uh, with that, here's my contact information. I'm gonna go ahead and leave this up for just a second. I know that was a kind of a ton of content on all areas, again, acknowledging that a, a the kind of subsequent trauma that's associated with these conversations. But ultimately, it's an important conversation to have because again, it is shown to be one of the most effective strategies. Uh, that being said, I, I, I think it's also important that we message effectively about it. Uh, talking about to the general public about conversations about mean safety, we need to be careful about what type of information we're including in those conversations so that we're not inadvertently increasing risk. So um, when we're having these conversations, um, be very vigilant about and aware of who is your audience for this conversation. Um, don't just take data and throw it at people. We do not want to let people know how lethal firearm suicide attempts are. That's a very dangerous message for us to send into our communities. Um, so again, just being critical of how you're messaging as it relates. For example, going back to the Coronado Bridge in San Diego, one effort was trying to raise awareness about the, you know, the number of suicides and the dangers associated with the Coronado Bridge, while, uh, you know, the other hand of, was trying to raise awareness about the need for that, uh, for the barrier, for restrictive uh, measures. So how do you raise enough public concern to get people to support the effort without inadvertently increasing risk for the general population or individuals who are at risk of suicide. 
So there's this constant push pull when we're making or creating messages about mean safety. So I just wanted to finish with that. It's a very important point. So uh, with that, I hope I haven't um, bored you too tremendously wow. today with all the data and all the information. And uh, we'll go back to more questions. Yeah, that was terrific. So there is one in the in the chat. Um, how is this drug disposal efforts at police stations communicated to BIPOC communities who do not have a good relationship with the police? I ask because I've never heard of this before, but can see how many people or how many can be hesitant to go this route for disposal of medication drugs. Uh, that's a great question, and I, I will not at all pretend to understand how our communications are going out that's um, specific to that. Um, and absolutely, I would agree that there are um, a variety of diverse communities um, and individuals who would be hesitant or extremely hesitant or fearful to go into a law enforcement department to, to drop that medication off. Um, I was just noting that as one of the law enforcement agencies and offices seem to be one of the more consistent locations that they're kind of there 24, uh, you know, 24-7 or, you know, there a lot of the other safe disposal efforts are often kind of one day events or one week events uh, that go into the community. Um, so I, I guess the answer, my response to that would be, we just need more efforts. We need more locations where people can take, we need to have better information and communication out to people of all communities and backgrounds about other locations. You know, So as a local pharmacy, do they have a mechanism for safe disposal? I would think that would be a much safer location uh, for people um, from diverse communities Uh oh, I think Stan's frozen. Stan, can you hear us? He needs to have that uh, that opportunity. There he is again. You I'm we here, froze up on us for I'm a here. minute. My internet, my uh, computer's telling me I'm unstable, but I think it's oh. <laughs> okay. Well, let's try this next question then. Can you review again the information about those who attempt suicide not attempting again? Every training I've ever attended about suicide has talked about the large percentage of repeat attempts and that those who completed suicide had attempted in the past or resources where we can view that info. Yeah, and I'd be happy, uh, again, I believe I have citations for each of the studies that I referenced, uh, but I'd be happy to share those. Um, so the data again to review that. So 90% of people who make an attempt will not go on later in life to die by suicide. 70% of people who make an attempt will not go on to make an attempt again. Now it's, again, how do you look at that data? So for me, you can look at that on one end and say, well, that means 70% of people aren't gonna make an attempt again, that's great news. Well, no, that still means that 30% will make an attempt again. And when it comes to suicide attempts, the reason why it is identified as a, as a risk factor uh, for future suicide risk is not just because of the thoughts of suicide, but because they have demonstrated that they are capable with going through with the suicide attempt. When you look at the theories, the interpersonal theory of suicide, and really dive deeply into the theories in the field, um, capability is one of the key factors that separates someone from having ideation or moving on to make an attempt. And so the idea that, uh, well, here's a, a, a bad metaphor that I'll share with you. So let's say that, um, I show up with a bus this afternoon and we all go skydiving. Um, I think most of us would agree, except for those of you who have been skydiving multiple times, that it would be pretty frightening, right? I've never been skydiving before. We're gonna go against this instinct for self-preservation. We're gonna jump out of a perfectly good airplane and risk our lives to go skydiving. Now let's say I come back with that bus tomorrow and I say, hey everybody, we're going skydiving again. I think you would probably agree that the second time you went skydiving, you would have less fear associated with the act, right? Because you have crossed that line before you have broken down that wall. And so that when someone makes an attempt, um, they have sh shown capability to, to dis you know, disregard that fear and go through with that attempt. Um, and so that's kind of the component of it that we're concerned about. So the good news is most people won't. Um, but we know that for the other percentage of people who will, uh, that fear is something that actually helps to keep us safe. And so we want to make, you know, have heightened vigilance around those individuals. Um, the other point to that, and final point, I'm sorry, this is taking so long to answer, but is that if someone who's made an attempt develops thoughts of suicide again and didn't get proper support and treatment, safety planning, ongoing care, 
if they do develop thoughts of suicide, they will oftentimes move more rapidly from thoughts into an attempt again. So I hope that made some sort of sense. But when you get the PDF, if you have any trouble finding the research studies, let me know. Next question. Do you have a resource list for families who have survived suicide loss? Um, a, a resource, I guess it would depend on the resource. Um, I think that, you know, is it, if it's looking for, you know, survivors of suicide loss support groups, AFSP, and I'm sure uh, through this effort here, through your collaborative, you probably are more, you know, more aware than I would be of local loss survivor opportunities. Um, there's a variety of books out there that have been written. Um, I hate to hesitate, I, I hesitate to you know, recommend one on a personal level um, because they, you know, can uh, can vary so much. Um, so I, I, I'm gonna say yes, uh, but let us follow up and then let that be part of a conversation that you as a collaborative have, because uh, that's really something locally that you should put together. Uh, what are your local resources that fit the local cultures that you represent? Um, but there's a variety of books and resources that are out there. I think one of the Biggest gaps in resources though is resources for youth and children who have lost somebody to suicide. Although we do a ton or we do the most for youth suicide prevention, we have the least in terms of literature and focus on youth postvention. So uh, there are a few uh, books out there that have been good uh, for working with that population. So I'm sorry, I don't have a perfect answer, but I'm gonna put the burden back on you guys to make that list. But I'll help you. That's cool. And Tiffany put up the list of resources on our local uptoriverside.org page. So we can check that out too. So we'll do one last question before we move on to subcommittee share outs. Um, so this says, I received information about how to safely dispose of drugs myself at home, putting drugs in a plastic bag with water and once dissolved, then throwing the bag into the trash. Are there any problems with this since people may not make the effort to go somewhere to dispose of it? Uh, that is a little bit out of the realm of my expertise as um, as an individual. I think if it does something to get rid of, I mean, obviously, ideally, safely disposing of them. Um, you know, the reason why we don't flush the the medications down the the toilet or something is uh, a lot of issues around wildlife. Some can even be dangerous for like you know, septic systems and all the things. Uh, my only concern. Uh, with that would be similar to the wildlife concerns. If you're throwing it in the trash, it's still gonna end up at a landfall and could potentially be toxic. Maybe it's dissolved enough, but this is not an area of expertise for me. Uh, so I'm gonna say uh, there's probably smarter people on the call who are more versed in this. I would say the, the ideal situation would be more disposals and to make them more accessible, have them more often, have more uh, visibility in the communities. Again, at CVS, at Walgreens, um, you know, multiple at the post office, I don't care, wherever you, you, you know, have them more accessible in the community. Okay, well, that's terrific. Thank you, Stan. I think that's the questions up to this point. Thank you so much. That was terrific. We everybody give Stan a round of applause. Thank you. And thank you to the uh, RISE interpreter for your support. Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm going to start us up here again. And Stan, I don't know if you're going to stick around or um, or if you... Yeah, I'm planning to hang out if that's okay, unless you need the bouncer to kick me out. Nope, absolutely stick around. So maybe there'll be more questions at the end. All right. Um, but we're gonna keep going forward. We wanna hear from our subcommittee. So before we get into that, uh, we wanted to just review really quickly what the organizational structure is of our coalition. So again, we mentioned earlier the, co the coalition leadership, which is myself and Rebecca representing uh, behavioral health and public health. And then we also have um, some behavioral health and public health staff from our teams that are helping to support each of the subcommittees with things like um, logistics, meetings, Zoom links, minutes, um, agendas and, and structure, and then and supporting their um, reaching the objectives in the plan. So keep helping to just keep that going. And then we have six subcommittees and we're gonna hear from each of them today to hear about their progress so far. Our subcommittees are effective messaging and communications, measuring and sharing outcomes, our upstream focus, prevention, intervention, and postvention. 
Okay, so we're going to transition now to have our subcommittee share out on their goals, accomplishments, and the next steps that they are taking uh, since what was reported at our last meeting in January. So this is an opportunity to uh, help us break down silos, look for partnerships between our different subcommittees, and see where we can work together to bridge the gaps in order to advance the goals in our strategic plan. So we'll provide a recap of each subcommittee's identified goals from the strategic plan and then have the co-chairs share that the, uh, the actions that they have taken or planned thus far to work towards these goals. So I believe the first uh, subcommittee that we have is our effective messaging and communications. Uh, the goals from this uh, from the strategic plan include increasing safe reporting of suicide and healthy social media use. This may include partnering with members of media to provide information about resources, integrating best practices into public campaigns and communication uh, strategies for suicide loss. And so we have uh, Jennifer Carson and Sarah Rodriguez uh, here with us and uh, maybe Jen and Sarah could share a bit about uh, the subcommittee's work thus far. Yes, hello everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Carson. Um, I run 951-686-HELP, the Inland Southern California Crisis Helpline. I'm also um, newly on the board of directors of the American Association of Suicidology. Um, I run the Attempt Survivor Lived Experience Division. Um, for our effective messaging um, subcommittee, um, we are a larger committee, so we decided to break into two work groups, and so those work groups focus on the two pieces of the self, the safe messaging, and then um, the, the more uh, communications PR component. Um, it is our goal to create a toolkit for uh, Suicide Prevention Month. Um, my co-chair Sarah will be sharing about that here in a minute, but our safe messaging group really um, did a deep dive into the research about safe messaging. And we talked a lot about our community, you know, Riverside County, you know, has um, a high um, Spanish speaking population and so on. And so we, we talked about safe messaging language and um, how we can make it um, accessible and um, uh, inclusive and so on. So we came up with some core messaging um, and um, I believe Sarah is going to share that. Are we able to share our screen, Diana? Oh, okay, I'll have to stop sharing. And Sorry. Can... Oh, that's okay. Um, so, um, and so Sarah can go ahead and share that, but we're going to be, she was going to show you a sample and then we're going to be producing a toolkit. For example, we would have the core messaging and then maybe um, a carousel for Instagram and so on. So I'm going to go ahead and hand off to Sarah. She's going to speak to you about the, the specifics for the toolkit. Thank you, Jen. Okay, let me just show you this document right here. So this is the document we've been working on. Um, this is going to be a PDF and this is very simple. This is the first one I created. It's got our logo, the uh, puzzle piece and a couple of do's and don'ts. And I just wanted to clarify that this toolkit is directed at um, journalists, uh, but also people who are influential in their community, people who run uh, next door groups, Facebook groups, you know, who are kind of uh, providing information to their communities, but who might not necessarily have this kind of uh, training on how to message around suicide that maybe your professional journalists like from the Associated Press or uh, other organizations like that would have. So this is uh, do provide resources and all this language came from the, the other group, the messaging group. And this was our first one. I'm thinking of changing the colors a little bit to make it a little bit more pleasing to the eye, but um, this is our Instagram. We, I just have one um, to just kind of share this messaging and that the safe acronym that the, we wanna be putting out there. Um, and 
again, with this toolkit, we want other organizations to be able to use it, other community organizations, um, CBOs, FBOs. Um, so we really want to make it something where, you know, other people can co-brand it, share it on their social medias, and we can share it on county social medias. Just really something that um, is accessible to kind of anyone who wants to put this messaging out. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments about, um, I, I did talk a little bit, we have this colorful bar on the top and the bottom, which we like, but doesn't quite look the same when you transfer it over to, I think it was made in Word, and when you transfer it over to Canva, it looks a little different, but it still looks nice. Um, so if anyone has any questions or comments on the toolkit, what the toolkit is for, or just the appearance of the social media uh, graphics, um, you can let me know. And uh, that's, that's all I have. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Let me pull the slideshow back up. All right. Oh. There we go. So now we're gonna move on to measuring and sharing outcomes subcommittee. To recap the goal in the strategic plan, it includes to advance data monitoring and evaluation, which may include partnering with the coroner or medical examiner to develop a method for accessing data to improve suicide prevention strategies. So I'll turn it over to Susanna, Lily, Amy, or Jocelyn, who can share an update about their work. I wasn't at the last meeting, so maybe Jocelyn would share. So at the last meeting, we actually want discussed a little bit more on well, following kind of what we talked about before, Susanna was uh -huh. what, um, how do we want to present the data um, when people request data? Uh -huh. um, do we want to have briefs? What kind of briefs? How are they going to access them? Things like that. We continued that conversation. And another point that was brought up in our last meeting too was we're getting a lot of requests from like education offices. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should invite somebody from, from um, one of the school districts, education to join our data coalition subcom subcommittee so that we can talk more about like what, what resources they have and how we can help and shape more briefs towards them um, since there, there's a lot of requests coming from that. Um, but yeah, it's just talking about the requests that we get and how to better um, address them since a lot of them could be a little broad. Thank you, Jocelyn. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, okay. Yes, definitely. We're, we are still kind of working on how can we have when someone makes that immediate request, a, a document we could give them that would give them some general overview information and enough information to um, to answer their questions, but we are getting some broad requests. I think there was one that came from a school district. I think it came through Rebecca where they wanted suicide and suicide attempts for their mental health initiative. But then in the email they asked for, uh, you know, all of the county anxiety and depression. You know, it's really beyond the scope of this, you know, subcommittee. And it, and it was a very large and broad request that would be a much deeper type of needs assessment, um, which we didn't have the capacity to do you know, resources to do asking about, you know, the level of anxiety of youth in Riverside County uh, broadly. <laughs> and so, well, you know, there's, there's limits to what, you know, we can produce data wise because they wanted it for, to shape their own, um, you know, mental health initiative. So I, I get why they're asking, but we wouldn't necessarily have the data that they're asking for, mm -hmm. but definitely the brief to share that, you know, I think I had one that was like, I need this tomorrow you know, or within two days, I gave them the SELPA slides and some other information that would be helpful to them um, since they needed it. The other one didn't have a time frame on it per se. Um, and the request was, you know, can you give us up-to-date information around suicide and suicide attempts? And, and then the larger email was around um, anxiety and depression for all the youth in Riverside County. So yeah, that was a much for, different request. For, the, for those first timers that are joining us, I think one of the main things we've talked about with this committee is not only providing the data to guide our specific strategies, 
but to also become the hub for the county in terms of data sharing. So collecting some or creating some presentations for these different audiences as you're describing, so that we're really making, we're, it's vetted through this process using all the best practices so that everything that's shared across our county, regardless of who's sharing it, is gonna be sharing best practice, most well-informed data. And so we're really aiming for this group to be the resource for all of that information across the county, across the board. So yeah, awesome, lots of work to do. Thank you guys. Okay, so now moving on, we do have uh, updates from our upstream uh, focused committee. Uh, we have um, our upstream subcommittee has two strategic approaches with the following goals and objectives. Uh, healthy and connected communities goal is to increase connectedness between people, family members and community. This could look like increasing services focused on fostering a sense of belonging and promoting a culture free of stigma and discrimination. Promoting resiliency's goal is to increase resilience and help seeking. This includes integrating activities into community-based services and increasing life skills and expanding services to increase help seeking behaviors and promote messages of resilience, recovery, and hope. So we have Shore and Mary with us uh, to provide some updates to you all. Um, and I just wanna uh, mention that Mary is uh, a new co-chair for us on our subcommittee. And, and I just want to acknowledge that and thank Mary for jumping into all of uh, the work that we are starting with. So um, I will oh. oh, sorry, a second. I'm sorry, my cat's out there acting crazy. I apologize for that. Hi, you guys. I'm sure and I am really, really excited to be here and to be on this committee. Um, and I welcome Mary um, as uh, my co chair. So this is really exciting. Um, we are working on some really great things. Rebecca had some things that she had listed out um, and helping with uh, Sheree not being here, but mainly what we're focusing on is how do we deal with two groups. Um, we're looking at youth and older adults because they, they have very high suicide risk rates. So how can we impact both of those groups? And what we looked at was doing some uh, videos and some correspondences between the two and impacting them together or having them work together. Diana, can I have share screen? Cause I would like to, yep. one of the things that we did was we created videos. We worked with our youth at different schools and um, they created some videos for our seniors or older adults. These would be circulated at uh, not only, um, um, you know, elder care places, but senior living um, anywhere where there are people that, you know, are looking for when someone. Rain, look for the rainbows and when it's dark, look for the stars. Make sure to stay in there and hang in there, you know, like the, like the poster says. Hi, my name is Angel, and I wanted to say that, hey, in there, your family misses you, and wants to see you, and you got this. Hey, I hope you're having a good day. Please stay positive and hang in there. I hope you have a good day. Remember, smiling is contagious, so smile at someone today. Everybody is going through the same thing. You just have to stay strong and believe. Hi, I just hope you have a good rest of your day, and always remember to keep your head up. Shoot from the moon, and even if you miss, you'll land in the stars. Hi, my name's Elisa, and wherever you go, no matter what the weather is, you should always bring your own sunshine, and I hope you're having an amazing day. <laughs> so we're doing things like that. I don't want to take up too much time with it, but I just wanted to show you some examples of what our youth are doing. So these are little bites that we're looking at packaging and sending off to elders. So. Um, one of our aspects is um, having a like a pin pal or a video pal where they communicate back and forth, but we also have messages going out that are just going out to different groups. Um, we do need support from the team. So right now I'm throwing my pitch out to the messaging committee. Jen, you guys, we need your help. How can we package this and what can we do? So maybe we can work together 
on um, how we can get this out to the people because we're having a bit of an editing issue right now. So we're hoping one of our um, partnering committees can work with us, but we're really excited about that. We're also did a survey for the older adults because we want to see how we can get them connected because connectedness is one of the things they're belonging and how we can reconnect them to our community and and get them involved. So um, I'm not sure if we have an example of that survey, but that will be going out. Um, Mary might have some more information on that. Good, uh, good morning, this is Mary. Um, I do have some information on it. We don't have it. I didn't prepare to have it um, shared today. So we will be able to do that the next time and we'll have some data from, um, from the surveys that have gone out for the next time. So hopefully we'll be able to see um, how our seniors are coping, um, especially over this uh, period of social isolation and um, what kind of coping methods they're using. We're also asking them on that survey um, if they're willing to share their um, their coping methods and um, and some of their experiences with with the youth, so we can connect them in that way. All right, terrific. Thanks for that update. So next, we're going to move and talk about in our prevention subcommittee. They've actually broken down into two work groups. So the first work group is focused on trainings. The strategic plan outlines the goals in this strategic approach to increase detection and screening to connect people to services based on suicide risk. This encompasses trainings to increase effectiveness of suicide risk screenings, assessments, and trauma-informed practices, and trainings to support identification and intervention to effective care. So I'll turn it to Shani and Stephanie to share some updates. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, so I am Stephanie and along with my co-chair, Tishani, um, we are um, co-chairing the prevention uh, focus on training subcommittee. And right now um, our focus has been on recruitment. Um, we definitely want to uh, increase and diversify our subcommittee with um, various members within the community. Um, so that way we can increase our expertise within the subcommittee and, you know, getting out um, our, our prevention strategy. Um, so, you know, backgrounds could be, uh, for example, um, people working with veterans, dom um, uh, domestic violence shelters, um, homeless shelters within the LGBTQ community. Um, so just those are just a few examples, not, and that's not to, um, you know, limit our, our outreach, but we definitely want to, um, again, just increase our, our subcommittee uh, numbers with people who have access to um, these communities that we want to um, get our, we want to increase the knowledge of prevention trainings. Um, so such as know the signs, um, counseling on access to lethal means, um, QPR, uh, for example. So um, we want to make sure that our community does have access to these training materials. And um, we also want to um, bring in uh, training within our own subcommittee, because uh, definitely I think within the field of suicide prevention, um, it, it's going, I, I mean, definitely we don't want it to be um, ever uh, continuing, but, you know, definitely I think within our own subcommittee, if we increase our own knowledge of uh, suicide prevention trainings and taking those trainings, it's only going to increase our expertise and, and um, increase our, our knowledge of how, of how to reach out to our communities. And um, what we have identified, though, as well is uh, language barriers. Um, definitely, we want to increase trainings um, that can have languages um, more accessible, such as um, other than English and Spanish, so Korean, Vietnamese, um, Chinese, or even um, Arabic, um, just as an example, um, you know, definitely we, we have recognized that there is um, some language barriers. Um, if, again, if we're reaching out to our community to uh, let people know that suicide prevention trainings are available, you know, English and Spanish, we definitely want to expand um, past those two main um, languages. And um, we also um, 
have recognized that there needs to be um, an increase of access to training within our schools. Um, so definitely um, part of our um, subcommittee is our engaging schools subcommittee. Um, so definitely they can speak to they can speak more on to that. All right, thank you for that update, Stephanie. And we'll move to the engaging schools work group. All right, hello, um, uh, Kathy Army. I will be going over our for, first goal um, focuses on um, Ed Code 215. Um, it really looks at I would say, implementing mental health training and education through K through 12. And some of the things that we've been um, discussing as options are the Be Hook Promise as a free option. Uh, we've discussed the TSAP program in a two uh, aspect of Ed Code 215. Having suicide prevention numbers on the back of the badges, but we've also discussed um, a, a little bit about the three digit code. And then um, we're also looking to to discuss an option with regards to um, a survey. So in the sense of what the VSAFE um, after vaccination healthcare checker has done, um, we were talking about uh, just like the way that there's texts, texts that went out just as like check-ins um, that sends to cell phones. Um, so that's just generally for goal one, what we've discussed. And I'll hand it off to Matt for goal number two. Everybody, I'm uh, Matthew Fraley, um, and uh, the second part for goal two was more of an evidence-based practice with uh, SEL kind of learning. Um, it's really exciting just because we've had so many different schools and districts that kind of have been a part of it, from Hemet to Merino Valley, uh, Kat and I are in Riverside, uh, Corona um, has been in there a few times, um, and just kind of what everyone else is doing, and that's kind of what's taken up a lot of our time, is just kind of seeing like what everyone has been um, doing. I know for uh, Hemet and Merino Valley. Um, I think there's a representative that's been in our group that's uh, in the meeting today. They've been doing BAR, uh, which is building assets and reducing risks, uh, where they kind of uh, work with those ninth graders as like um, a licensed therapist. And then if there's red flags that come along the way, they're kind of sticking with them uh, through high school. Um, Sandy Hook promised that uh, Kat had kind of talked about. Um, and then with that, they do like start with Hello Weeks. I know at my school at JW North, um, last year when we were on campus, uh, we did like start with Hello Weeks uh, to really help engaging with students um, in doing um, those kind of things. Um, and then different things that um, our different schools have been doing for um, Riverside. Uh, we have staff counselors that do individual counseling, uh, circle groups, um, and then the other school districts that do uh, mindfulness lessons, uh, self-care, coping skills. So it's really trying to just target like us as a whole, like what are the things that we can do as far as goal number two. And then uh, Kat's gonna wrap us up with our third goal. All right, so goal three. What well, goal three really focuses on is reviewing existing youth programs and then uh, the recommended list of districts to facilitate. Um, so really just trying to find something that's consistent and concise among the different districts. So one main thing that we've been able to do with this is partner with uh, it's a group called Gen Up, and it's actual youth um, our community. And right now, what they've been working on, and I'll just say that they're a phenomenal group of um, young adults that kind of blew us away in the last meeting when we had them in there. Um, they're actually already working with state senators to pass mental health bills. So um, an example is SB 14 bill to ensure absence absences due to mental health is uh, considered excused, um, that 50% of school staff undergo training and allowing students grade 10 through 12 to undergo training of mental health. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, there is SB 224, which is requires uh, students to receive instruction on mental health three times during the school year. Um, so they're actually already doing a lot of this great work. So one of the things that we did with them is try to see um, where they're at, what districts, and then we were able to also see if there's anything else that they know of that's consistent through other districts with regards to youth programs, existing youth programs in there. There isn't very much, it's kind of differs among sites. So what we were able to do in that meeting um, we had recently is also connect them to other school sites to be able to really look at starting that as a consistent program. Um, since we do work with um, 
students across the California and they're already working um, on mental health um, bills. So we've had a lot of success with that. It was, it was pretty impressive um, what they're already doing and they want to partner up to work with us and kind of help us um, also kind of gear our work since they're the ones that we're, we're doing the work for as well. So it was really impressive. So that's some of the work that we've been doing. Great, thanks. Okay, so now we have uh, our subcommittee that is focused on intervention. And uh, with this, within this subcommittee, uh, the strategic approaches of mean safety and expansion and integration of suicide prevention in health services is part of this committee. Uh, so I will uh, hand it over to Jim and Joanna to share a bit about uh, what this committee has been working on. Um, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I'm not in my office, so I'm uh, in a um, other uh, um, um, unit in the in the desert, so I don't have my microphone that that I usually use. So um, we are working um, to um, improve um, um, collaboration and follow through with uh, different levels of care. So we've reached out to um, some of the crisis providers in each region, um, inpatient units and um, 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 emergency departments. We've kind of divided into what we call sub subcommittees, um, looking at um, um, regional resources. One of our goals is to collaborate um, better, to have better follow through um, when, 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 when when consumers go from one level of care to another. And uh, we wanted to let inpatient units know and crisis services know that we're interested in, um, in improving follow-up. We wanna let them know that we want to um, um, reduce crisis services and um, relieve, frankly, the burden that's often put on them for um, crisis services. The questions we, we've developed and we've gotten some responses. One of the questions is what is the usual discharge protocol and follow-up plan for a consumer with suicidal ideation? What resources are they provided to discharge? Uh, for example, 24-hour hotline, clinic numbers, et cetera. What would help from an outpatient perspective to improve follow-up care for them? Uh, do they discuss mean safety during discharge and fam uh, with family, caregiver, or support systems? Um, would exploring natural resources like schools, um, school counselors, teachers, extended family, churches, and others be helpful? Are there are items uh, in the discharge plan that would be important for school personnel to be aware of? Uh, are these conversations regarding scheduling or re-entry plan with schools for minors um, appropriate thing to pursue? Uh, what type of supports are in place or at home or in the communities to support not only kids, uh, but adults being discharged or friends and family members part of the discharge conversation? And would someone from uh, their hospital, medical center, um, ED, a crisis services, like to be involved in the process of building upon discharge procedures for an individual with suicidal ideation. And our RDA interested in becoming involved in our, our collaborative. We are trying to increase um, um, membership, um, especially in different parts of, uh, of the county where we're, we're not as well um, represented. Um, we also have began to discuss uh, best practices regarding mean safety. So we really appreciated uh, what Jen had to say. Um, it challenges us to move in that direction as well. I don't, uh, Joanna, did I miss anything you'd like to share or um, anybody else from the committee? No, I think you covered it all. Thank you, Jim. All okay. right, terrific. Thank you guys. And last but not least, we have our postvention subcommittee. And the main goal in this part of the strategic plan is to expand support and services following a suicide loss. And here to share updates is Dr. Jill Miller and Brenda Scott. Good morning, everyone. So our postvention committee has 
decided to use the loss team training with Noah Whitaker. We're able to um, acquire this training for free. So free is good. <laughs> um, as a reminder, the loss, um, the loss team focus is an active postvention model made up of a team of trained survivors who would go to the scenes of suicides to disseminate information about resources and um, install hope for newly bereaved. Um, we also plan on building a volunteer base to recruit and train and also hope to expand TIP, which is trauma intervention uh, program, TIP volunteers. Um, we plan on um, working with the coroner's department on also um, sending loss kits to survivors. And uh, Brenda's gonna add additional information from our committee. Um, yes, one of the things that we're also working on is um, we wanted to see about getting more people on our committee. Um, hospitals, colleges, IEHP, Molina, uh, maybe somebody from uh, social workers uh, groups or a California um, Association of Marriage and Family Therapists uh, reaching out to get someone from Kaiser. So, you know, just, just some people that we're trying to add also to this committee to get that extra expertise. Then another thing we talked about was uh, 988 because we have that legislation that by June of 24, we need to be thinking about our county, thinking about how we're going to be um, use, utilizing 988. And I know there's been some discussion going on, but um, I had I was going to send to the groups a, something that NAMI did. It's a help, not handcuff series. And it was a three um, different uh, presentations. And I could have that forwarded to, to folks so you could see some of the different models that are going on for 988 around our country. Yeah, that'd be great, Brenda. That, that's a little outside the post pension focus, but yes, that would be awesome to share with this group. So we'll have more information around 988 as we get more in the coming months. All right, um, anything else from post pension? Okay, terrific. Thank you guys for that update. And so now we're open for, we have a few minutes for any questions that anyone may have for our co-chairs of any of the six subcommittees or anything, um, any questions for Stan? Diana, there was one question about what somebody's asking about joining the subcommittees. And as a, as a, a co-chair, we would love to have people join us. So um, yeah, so you uh, can email um, you can yeah. email PEI at ruhealth.org and ask for um, and let them know of your interest. And then my staff will send out to you our strategic plan if you don't already have that, along with more information about each subcommittee, their calendar meeting timelines. And when you identify which one you want to be a part of, we will get you all the Zoom links and get you connected to the co-chairs. So that's the best way to do it. PEI at ruhealth.org. And I can't see the chat. So if there are things popping up in the chat, if somebody wants to read them out for me or- um, Yeah, I was trying to help you. General <laughs> comments. <laughs> so there is a question, are we allowed to join these subcommittees committees, or find out the dates and times that they join? Yep, so if you email PEI at ruhealth.org right there on the screen, you just let them know of your interest and we will get you a um, PDF copy of the strategic plan, the list of all the subcommittees and what they focus on, as well as their calendar meeting dates. They all meet regularly, whether it's like the fourth Monday of the month at 10 o'clock um, or something like this. So you can see if that works with your calendar, let my staff know, and then we will get you the Zoom links and get you connected to those co-chairs. Any questions specific to um, mean safety or any of the updates from the subcommittees as they were shared today?
I do have, um, I have an announcement. So maybe people are thinking about a question. If it's in the chat again, please um, somebody read it. Rebecca, if you can monitor that because I can't see it as I'm screen sharing here. Um, but I do want to remind everyone that May is Mental Health Month and we are launching um, our virtual campaign next week. If uh, you may, some of you may know last year, we did do a virtual campaign and this year we're aiming to do something similar but bigger. And so you'll be getting some information from me. Um, anyone who's attended this meeting, you're now on my list. So all you first timers, you're gonna start getting some emails from me. I will only send you things that are um, important and related to mental health awareness and suicide prevention. And so we'll be getting you some information later today about May is Mental Health Month. We have a calendar of activities along with a guide that describes more activities that we're asking people to participate in activities in the safety and social distancing of your own home, neighborhood, workplace, and um, focus on the theme of hope for change, uh, which comes from the Each Mind Matters toolkit for May is Mental Health Matters Month, and using hashtag PEI May 2021 and um, hashtag hope for change. Uh, post all of your activities on social media, share them with us, so we can begin to track and see across Riverside County how we're spreading information and education about mental health and um, reducing stigma so that we make help seeking um, more comfortable for people when they need it. And so uh, we'll be sending out emails with video announcements and those, the calendar and the activity guide every Monday in May. And each week there are designated activities that you can sign up for um, all free. There are trainings, there are presentations, there are, there's an art contest. And there's lots of different things you can do in your community and in your work site. And we ask that you send that information, not only to those that you work with, but also um, to your neighbors and friends and family members. And we really want to spread that information. So be on the lookout for that. Okay, who's asked a question in the chat? Is there anything that's come up? Doesn't look like we have any questions um, at this time. Okay. And you guys, of course, can feel free to unmute and ask a question. Or Rebecca, if you have any up announcements or updates you want to share. Uh, just one. As part of Bay's Mental Health Month, we have, um, through our Teen Suicide Awareness and Prevention Program, have developed some uh, videos uh, that we will be sending out to schools who would like to promote uh, messaging for the month. And we have uh, actually develop these videos in course um, uh, in um, partnership with the uh, the inf uh, information that Diana's group has has uh, developed as well so we'll be sending out those uh, videos and information to uh, schools uh, within the next few days so if you would like uh, that information, uh, please let me know and I can uh, make sure that you uh, also receive the, um, the content that we will be sharing. Great, thanks, Rebecca. Any final questions, thoughts, or comments? Then I am gonna give you the gift of eight minutes in your day that you thought you were gonna be in a meeting. Go get a stretch, take some self-care, and we are going to see you guys on Wednesday, July 28th at 9 a.m. for our next quarterly update. Be on the lookout for those May's Mental Health Matters um, um, emails and um, email us at PEI at ruhealth.org for any questions. Thanks so much, everybody, and have an awesome day. Thank you. Thank you so much.